Sergio over there. He actually was my mentor to teach me how to do T cars. What's a T car? T car is carotid stenting, where instead of coming from the groin, you actually come from right above the collarbone. And why? Because T car, your stroke rate is as good as surgery, one percent. Coming from groins at four percent. Right. So it's really it's the new wave. It's the way to go. Um, what I also hear is that, um, obviously, I'm from Indiana University, is that people at, at, at Loyola that I know tell me this guy's a workhorse. The guy loves being on call. That on call, he loves adding cases at 1 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. You're going all night whenever he's on call. They're like, who's on call tonight? Jacob, talk to yourself. So they're like, oh my God, be prepared for work all night. <laughs> so, but thank you so much, Dr. Chosmo, for you know for really taking the time to give this important lecture, which is on pharmacotherapy with the Crimbar Children's Disease Patient. All right. financial disclosures. I wish this was a page full of them. <laughs> so this is a picture of the Marlboro Man. Um, we glorified smoking for a long, long time. And this particular gentleman, uh, he's a mailman. He has weakness in his left leg. It happens when he walks after a, a very defined amount of distance. And it's been getting worse and worse over the past year. Um, and it's now affecting his job since he's a mailman. It goes away when he stops walking and he has no problems otherwise, no tissue loss, no rest pain. He does have many other risk factors, um, specific coronary and cardiovascular disease. He had a heart attack, despite that he's still smoking. He has chest pain, um, intermittently, and again, he still smokes a pack and a half. His family has diabetes, he doesn't know if he does, and his mom died of a stroke. So this is a prototypical classic patient uh, that I see in my vascular clinic all the time. And so we do an exam, and you can see on this exam here, he doesn't have any palpable pulses in his left leg. His pulses in the contralateral leg are all diminished. He's hypertensive. He has bruises in his ma major vascular beds. His labs are not quite normal. His sugar is a little elevated. His creatinine is a little elevated. Um, and his uh, EKG that was in the chart shows an old inferior MI. So for these peripheral arterial disease, or PAD talks, we usually like to brag and show off our success stories. And so this is an example of one. Here's his occlusion. Here's an SFA complete occlusion from the origin all the way down to almost the adductor canal. And we're able to balloon it. As Jean mentioned, Dr. Ken Pullet, I love doing endo a lot more than open. And so if I can do it uh, endo, I almost always do. And it makes me very happy like I'm, I want a video game. And so here he goes open up his SFA and he has restored flow and his claudication is resolved. But um, the point of this talk is that's not the most important step in this uh, patient's journey. It's arguably the least important step. Um, because without medical management, none of this is going to work. Uh, one, it's not going to last. And uh, two, he's going to keep coming back. So the first thing is diagnosis of PAD. You might think that story I just mentioned, classic PAD, he has nothing else. But actually, the most common problems in the leg are orthopedic and neurologic in nature. So here's a, a table from the SVS guidelines. And if you look here, so they list a bunch of other common problems in the legs. Foot and ankle arthritis, common. Spinal stenosis, common. PAD, it's there, it's a problem, but it affects 3% of the population. So even though that guy had the prototypical classic symptoms of PAD, you have to rule out the more common causes. Because what happens if I did this procedure and he had arthritis of the knee? He's not gonna be any better, he's still gonna have problems. 
So you have to diagnose it correctly, and you have to rule out more common problems, neurogenic, orthopedic, even severe CAD, COPD can cause claudication too. So you gotta rule out the more common problems. And once you've ruled out the common problems, then you can address PAD. How do you work up PAD? Well, this gold standard is an ankle brachial index. The problem is as today's population is changing, it's becoming less and less reliable. So specifically in patients with diabetes, the ABI is false. The calcification that happens in the vessels um, in the foot make the ABI falsely elevated or completely non-compressible and completely unuseless. So in those patients, a TBI or toe brachial index is a little bit more useful. Normally, an ABI less than 0.9 is abnormal. For the TBI or toe brachial index, you put a tiny cuff on the toe, and practically every hospital has this. So even though they don't do this routinely, they should be able to do it. Instead of putting a blood pressure cuff at the ankle, you put the blood pressure cuff at the toe and measure the Doppler waveform. And you measure the pressure, and you do that in relation to the brachial pressure. And the normal is greater than 0.7, so abnormal is less than 0.7. Um, other scenarios that are less common is if you have an ABI that looks normal, but you really walks and talks like there's a PAD problem, you can get an exercise stress test. Uh, that's where you put a patient on a treadmill and walk them, and then check their ABI after immediately walking them. Uh, there's other tests you can do, arterial duplex, CAT scan, CTA, diagnostic angiography, but uh, the, I just want to get across, ABI is the most important screening test, but in the future, TBI will probably become as common or an auto uh, reflex ordered test, because it's so common in our diabetic patients. So it's not as common as orthopedic problems like arthritis or sciatica, but it's common. It happens in about 4% of all adults, so that's 1 in 20 of all Americans, and it increases with age. So you can see in young patients it's uncommon, less than 1%, but in the older patient population it's up to 15%. So the older you get, the more likely you'll have some element of PAD. And unfortunately, even though smoking is a lot less common today, the prevalence of PAD is increasing, and the reason? Well, let's look at all the risk factors for PAD. So the risk factors for PAD are the same risk factors for CAD. Unfortunately, race is one component, but cholesterol, hypertension, smoking, diabetes. So because these problems, cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, are increasing in prevalence, the PAD is increasing in prevalence. So. Uh, it's unfortunate that although our, pep, our patient population is a little bit healthier, smoking a little less, they still have severe PAD because of all these other risk factors. So I mentioned that the same risk factors for CAD are the same risk factors for PAD, and there's a symbiosis between PAD and CAD. So when I see someone in my office with PAD, I'm actually not as worried about them losing the leg, as I am worried about them having a stroke or dying. So what I quote my patients, uh, it's what we, like our lore, what we routinely teach, is that the risk of them losing the leg, if they have PAD, regular PAD, not very severe, but regular PAD, is only a percent or less a year. So that's not too high, they're not gonna lose their leg. But the risk of them dying or having a stroke over five years is 15, 20, 25%, so if you do that annually, that's a five, four or five percent risk of them having a stroke or death every year. So what's more important in managing their PAD is managing their whole body, including their presumed CAD. The patient may not have a history of a heart attack or stroke, but you know atherosclerosis happens everywhere. It didn't just happen in the leg. It happens throughout the body. So you have to treat the patient as a whole, and it's arguably more important treating their pharmacotherapy and medical management of PAD than it is for me to fix the problem in the way. So what happens when you get severe PAD? Well, you get tissue loss, gangrene. Here's an ugly picture, sorry, I'll labor it, um, of toe gangrene. And when you get tissue loss, unfortunately, you can lose the leg. So of those patients, so let me go back, again, only 1% of the patients annually can progress to CLI. If you get CLI, there's a 25% risk of losing your leg. So you went from a 1% risk of losing your leg annually to a 25% risk of losing your leg. 
So these are the patients we're most worried about. And if you lose your leg, you, you have a much higher chance of dying. So again, I said normally for regular PAD patients, the risk of death is four or 5% annually. In the patient population with CLI and amputation, the mortality at one year is around 17%, at more than two years, it's 45%. That's an extremely high risk of death. So these are the, the sickest patients. And arguably, you might think, well, a patient who just had a cabbage is a very sick patient, or a patient who just had a stroke is a very sick patient, but severe PAD or critical limb ischemia patients have the, practically the highest mortality of anyone in the hospital, except perhaps for the dialysis patients. And so when you compare these mortality rates for PAD to other problems that are more commonly publicized, like breast cancer, colon cancer, Breast cancer has a five-year mortality of less than 20%. Colon cancer has a five-year mortality, depending on your stage, of up to 40%, but PAD is higher than all of those. So it's a bad problem that I wish got publicized more. And it's not just death. There's things that are worse than death, and I would argue that stroke is even worse than death. So as your ABI decreases, your risk of death, increases, your risk of heart attack increases, and your risk of stroke increases, and your risk of amputation. So severe PAD are harborings of everything that's bad. Heart attack, stroke, death, amputation.